A phenome, um, there's two ways of looking at it. One is from an analytical point of view, which is the sum of all the measurable physical and chemical parameters and properties that define biological subgroups. What that means is different diseases have got different flavours and different properties and we try and measure those. Um, but from a philosophical point of view it's where genes and environment meet together. So you have a genetic background uh, that you're born with and your lifestyle um, and how you play your genes if you like as cards in a game of life throughout your life determine um, whether you get diseases and your likely responses to therapies for diseases. We appreciate that genetics is very important for understanding the reason why some people develop disease at certain stages and others don't. It's only a small part of the whole story. So our environment, and that our environment in its widest sense, that's... The Christie treats more than 44,000 patients a year, and each one of these patients is unique. Just as their genetic makeup, DNA and fingerprints are uniquely specific to them, so too is the makeup of their cancer. And so cancer treatment must become much more sophisticated and adapt to each patient's individual needs. Here at the Christie, a new era of cancer diagnosis and treatment is being developed. This is called molecular diagnostics. As part of this, we are raising funds for the target project. This project will be the first step in revolutionizing the way in which cancer is diagnosed and treatment choices are made. Previously, the diagnostic process has relied on sections of tumour that have been examined under the microscope. But we can now go further. We can actually identify at a molecular level some of the abnormalities that have arisen as a result of the development of the cancer. And that allows us to specify which particular treatments might be most useful in those circumstances. The Helix Centre is a collaboration between Imperial College and the Royal College of Art. And the idea is to bring designers and embed them in the hospital, in the setting that they're designing for, so to be close to the end users they're designing for and the problems they're trying to solve. The building itself was designed as part of a competition we ran at the architecture department at the Royal College of Art. So this building was designed by four students of architecture from the RCA. Uh, they won the competition and the pop-up was built a year ago. I was first diagnosed with cirrhosis earlier this year. It was shocking because um, I've only ever thought of cirrhosis as affecting people who drink um, and I don't drink so it came as uh, a bit of a bolt out of the blue. Birmingham is quite a unique place in liver disease. We have a university that leads the world in liver disease research. And we have a hospital that has one of the most famous liver units in the world with a track record of liver transplantation going back decades. In 2008, we were awarded a grant from the UK government, from the National Institutes for Health Research, uh, to translate the work we've been doing in the Centre for Liver Research, the basic laboratory work, into new treatments for liver disease. I'm very fortunate we have a, a large clinical liver unit staffed with outstanding clinicians and clinician scientists. And that's underpinned by a laboratory set up, the Centre for Liver Research, which includes basic scientists, uh, clinician scientists working on, on the mechanisms of liver disease. But the NIHR Biomedical Research Unit uh, has extended that into an early phase clinical trials unit and uh, the kind of res support staff, research nurses, trialists and statisticians who allow us to design and implement our clinical trials to complement the work we're doing on basic research. A PPI stands for Patient and Public Involvement and we represent the patient and the public interest in research. We make sure that that research when it's designed and run and disseminated actually delivers benefit for patients. We wanted to work with the PPI team because the process of an individual patient data meta-analysis is potentially and often quite a dry statistical process, it takes place uh, with one or a few people clustered around a computer and it's very hard to disseminate that into the wider uh, public and media perspective. With, with Interfest, the researcher was incredibly enthusiastic. He wanted us to be involved, he was happy to explain stuff to us, listen to what we had to say and make changes to his bid. As a GP, I receive a lot of patient feedback, so I probably thought I, I knew what the patient's and user's perspective might be. 
Uh, clearly that wasn't the case. The team were able to take my ideas, my research proposals, and really open them up and illuminate them in a totally different way. I'm Martin James and I'm a stroke physician in Exeter and I've been working with colleagues in Penn Clark on a project to improve the delivery of vital clock busting treatment to people with stroke. Our business in providing a stroke service is all about trying to reduce the amount of disability that people end up with after a stroke, uh, particularly as that's a lifetime of disability. So our focus was always on delivering as much treatment, clock busting treatment, uh, as possible as quickly as possible. We were very excited about this project because it came directly from the consultant at the hospital and it fitted very well with our methods. Uh, we could use computer simulation which is a means of using a computer to model the pathway of a patient in that stage of their care and um, we were able to then show that simulation for a range of different change scenarios. So when Penn Clark presented their results to us we sat down as a team to look at how we thought we could make improvements from it and it became quite clear that if we were alerted to patients arriving with the stroke before they actually got there we would be able to shave off quite a lot of time on that patient pathway so their patient flow is much quicker their treatment is much earlier and they're in the right place at the right time i'm vicky goodwin i'm a senior research fellow at the university of exeter medical school and i'm a physiotherapist by background uh, one of my main research projects at the moment is around patient initiated clinics so normally people get regular appointments with their consultant every few months. Uh, unfortunately this might be when they're well and when they're unwell and have a flare-up of their condition they may not be able to get an appointment when they need it. So patient initiated clinics are a different approach to uh, seeing the, the consultant. So patients ring up a nurse advice line to start with when they have a flare-up and then the nurse will arrange an appointment either with the specialist or with the nurse specialist uh, within 14 days. Okay, well, uh, you know, as a direct access patient, I can certainly make an appointment with the consultant and we'll get that set up. Okay. So we've been working with the rheumatology team at Derriford Hospital, specifically with people with rheumatoid arthritis. And what we found when we've been evaluating uh, this new service is that patients feel more in control of their condition. They feel confident using the new system and they feel they're seen when they need to be seen. Operational research is all about helping people to make informed decisions. Very often in the health service and in other industries, people make decisions without any evidence or with very limited or poor evidence. And actually by applying some modelling, simulation, data analysis techniques, we can help people to make better decisions. And we can do that by showing them what the impact of making those decisions might be. All of our projects start with the health service. People from uh, the NHS approach us and explain that they have a particular problem. It might be uh, cues in the system, it might be that they want to take a decision and they don't know what's going to happen. So our starting point is to talk to those people in the NHS. All of our projects take place very quickly. We understand that problems in the health service need to be sorted very quickly and in very tight timescales. So all of our projects take place within three months. And in that time we can do some really useful things. Uh, we can give people the ability to make better decisions and better decisions means better services, more efficient services and in some cases uh, patient lives saved. Today is our annual day of celebration of the research activity that goes on at UCLH in partnership with UCL. So what we've got is 28 stalls we tried to choose a spectrum of disease areas, but also stalls that were likely to be interactive and interesting for patients. They range from demonstrations of some laboratory science, extracting DNA, how we analyze cell biology, showing imaging technologies, how we do endoscopies, frontline discovery in cancer treatments, dementia, I mean, just everything. So it's, it's been really, really exciting. It's very apparent that Increasing numbers of our patients are frail and they're older people. Particularly we notice that when older people have an acute problem such as infection, often it makes them more confused or become newly confused and that has big implications for how we look after them in the general hospital. One of our main research studies um, is about patients who have strokes or mini-strokes, so-called TIA, 
and we are very reliant on patients with these problems agreeing to participate in our research. And one of the reasons for that is that we need to have a clear understanding of how it affects the whole population. So we really need to have good engagement with the public so that we can get a good sample of people to take part in our studies. Part of the reason why I filled in the Yorkshire Health Study was because I wanted to give something back to the community and as a medical student I know how important it is to get evidence from the population and do general health surveys. Hopefully it will um, yield some interesting information about the population's health as a whole um, which could you know, impact future treatments and stuff and how doctors treat people coming into surgeries. It's quite good to be involved in something that's growing and expanding, so I'm quite happy to be part of the Yorkshire Health Study because people need to know about developing services about Yorkshire and what Yorkshire people need. I mean, I'm only on one person, but if there are lots of people like me together, we'll build up enough evidence so that we can say what is important to us in the way that services are delivered. The Yorkshire Health Study is a, a large study following the lives of people, tens of thousands of people in Yorkshire, what we're really interested in knowing is about the health of people in Yorkshire and we're looking at ways to improve the health of people in the long term. So already 28,000 people have filled in questionnaires and sent them back to us which is fantastic and now people have the potential to fill in the questionnaire online. The biggest challenges of our time centre around nutrition and lifestyle and going forward the NIHR Southampton BRC will be tackling those challenges. So the rates of obesity have gone up hugely over time, particularly over the past two to three decades. Around 60% plus of our adults are either overweight or obese. That's a real concern for them, but it is also a great concern that those changes are being seen in our children as well. They face a lifetime of carrying excess weight. We know that if they're overweight as children, they're more likely as adults to be overweight, and they face the health consequences. Standout achievements of the Southampton BRC to date include the demonstration that prevention of obesity in the next generation of children critically depends on improving the diet and lifestyle of young people as they head into parenthood before and during pregnancy and that if we are to reverse the tide of childhood obesity we need a much broader vision of how to do that. Primary care is amazingly important for the National Health Service and in fact for an increasing number of healthcare systems. The bulk of disease presents and is entirely managed in primary care in the NHS. But latterly it's become important because it's the place where serious disease is often first recognised and obviously we want to do that as early as possible. So these are all important functions of primary care, hence the priority to have a bigger evidence base to guide clinical practice and that is indeed why the NIHR School for Primary Care Research was first established in 2006 to increase the evidence base to guide practice. How do you go beyond simply integrating care, which is what the five year forward view primarily is about, to embracing as well uh, a genuine commitment and focus on improving health and well-being health outcomes? At the moment there's a real lack of high quality primary care evidence for many of the common problems that doctors see every day and as such patient care suffers. What we're hoping with the school is that we can develop a really strong cohort of researchers who answer the questions that are important to both clinicians and to patients to improve outcomes. Hello, my name is Jerome Breen. I lead on bioresource genomics and biomarkers for the National Institute of Health Research, Biomedical Research Centre for Mental Health. Come inside, I'll show you around. Our bioresource team and lab team are based here in the MRC SGDP Centre at the Institute of Psychiatry. We are trying to achieve translational medicine, taking basic science into clinical practice as quickly as possible using modern genomic approaches. These are our laboratories and here we conduct genomics, proteomics and biomarker experiments. Our goals are to develop a bioresource for mental health a resource of samples and a resource of patients willing to take part in research, such as clinical trials. 
In addition, we want to develop biomarker and genomic tests that will help predict which patients will respond to which treatment. This will help predict prognosis for a patient and will be of clinical utility. This is a very large and sophisticated and diverse facility that offers unique opportunities across a wide spectrum of medical science and offers real prospects of improving patient care. There are three areas in which activity will occur. There is an experimental medicine facility, there is a clinical trials facility, and there is a cell therapy unit. And each of those bring unique contributions to our overall clinical research facility. Vaccines are probably the most effective medical intervention that has ever been invented. So they save millions of lives, the estimate is two and a half million lives every year, and there's huge potential. What we do is we develop vaccines to save people's lives, to prevent infection, and the only way we can do that is by engaging with people who come along and volunteer in our clinical trials. And if people aren't going to do that, no vaccines will be developed. So it's very important for us to be able to engage, to let people know what's going on, and particularly here to let people know in our local community. The Biomedical Research Centre in Oxford is a large programme of translational research funded by the Department of Health to support the partnership between the University of Oxford and the Oxford University Hospitals NHS Trust. the basic science research typically from the university laboratories here in the heart of the National Health Service Hospital to make that research more beneficial for patients in a shorter time period. My name is Rob Stewart and I'm a professor at the Biomedical Research Centre for Mental Health. I've been academic lead for CRIS since it was set up in 2008 and my job is to ensure that we support the best possible research across the centre and beyond. I'd like to highlight three developments which I believe are key to this. The first is that we are able to bring in important information from other sources. For example, mental health records obviously focus on mental health care, but we have linked these with information on hospital care and general practice in order to have a lot of detail on the physical health conditions experienced by our patients. We know that people with mental health problems face a lot of disadvantages in their physical health. However, this work is enabling us to pinpoint key areas where healthcare can be genuinely improved. The second development is that we are now able to use very large amounts of in-depth information that is recorded in documents which would not otherwise be available for analysis. In particular, we work with experts in the field of natural language processing and have designed programs which identify important features from the health record, such as the symptoms someone is experiencing or the treatments that they are receiving. In this way, we can capture a great deal of detail about real-world mental health issues in very large populations to look at which treatments work best for which people. Finally, we've built up a skilled research team from many backgrounds computer scientists, public health researchers, clinicians and many more. The information contained in a database like CRIS is both very large and very complex and I cannot emphasise enough the importance of experience and expertise across disciplines. We are also very fortunate to work with a wide network of international leaders in mental health research at King's Health Partners and beyond. My name is Dr Johnny Downs. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and clinical researcher at King's College London. I've received a Medical Research Council grant to use CRIS to examine the health and education outcomes in children with Autism Spectrum Disorders, or ASD, who develop mental health problems. CRIS provides a very important resource that allows me to understand the experience of children with autism and mental health problems. For example, in a recent study I found that for children with autism, who present to specialist mental health services, over 50% of them will have additional psychiatric diagnoses. I also found that children with these additional psychiatric disorders are much more likely to receive off-label pharmacological treatment in addition to psychological support. Until now, and without the ability to use a resource like CRIS, 
it has been difficult to understand the types of mental health problems that children with autism present with and how they are treated by specialist NHS services. Another very important aspect of CRIS is the link it provides with other anonymised datasets. Hello, I'm Qingguo Chen. I'm currently a senior researcher in my sixth year working at the BRC Nucleus. My current research interest is about the long-term physical consequences of severe mental illness, which includes schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and skills affective disorder sometimes also major depression. I'm focusing on general and cause-specific mortality and the risk of cancers, cardiovascular diseases and respiratory diseases like COPD, asthma, influenza and pneumonia. Through linking the South London and Mosley data to other data set, we are able to assemble various comparison scenarios to answer questions about the severity of suffering for people with severe mental illness not only for mental suffering, but also their physical illness. My name is Dr. Rashvi Patel, and I am a psychiatrist and medical researcher at King's College London, using CRIS to investigate clinical outcomes in people who have psychotic disorders, such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. This work is part of my clinical research training fellowship from the Medical Research Council. CRIS offers a really exciting opportunity to do clinical research using data from a very large number of people receiving mental health care in the South London and Maudsley NHS Trust. This means that you can answer research questions which would otherwise be impossible through other means. One example is a study I have performed to investigate the impact of cannabis use in over 2,000 people with a psychotic disorder. Using a technique called natural language processing, I identified whether people with a psychotic disorder had used cannabis prior to their first episode of illness. I found that around 50% of people with a first episode of psychosis had used cannabis and those who did were more likely to be admitted to hospital and spend around 35 extra days in hospital in the five years following their first episode. I also found that cannabis use was associated with an increased likelihood of failure of antipsychotic treatment, suggesting that people who use cannabis are less likely to respond to standard treatments for psychotic disorders. I'm Michael, and I'm in the first year of my PhD studies here at King's. I'm based in the Biomedical Research Centre, where we have a large team of informaticians and access to a large anonymised data set of mental health care records. My research is primarily within the field of natural language processing in relation to mental health care. This mostly involves using computers to extract information from the anonymised clinical records. The two main methods I use are machine learning, where I train a computer to identify areas of interest in the records. This usually involves giving the computer a few hundred examples of what I'm looking for, and then sending it off to look for similar examples in the 20 million documents within the records. Secondly, I develop rules-based methods where on a simple level you can search for a sentence that contains certain keywords in a particular order. But the complexity of this can be scaled up with extra layers of rules and exceptions. Eating disorders are severe psychiatric disorders. People who suffer from them have intense worries about shape and weight and engage in extreme dietary practices like starvation and vomiting. Eating disorders tend to start in early teenage years, but a lot of young people have mild versions or even have a few symptoms of the disorders. Treatment for young people when they first become ill can be quite effective, and the earlier you seek help, the better. But sometimes, people can have an eating disorder for many years, which can lead to significant health problems, and in extreme cases, even death. And this is why it is essential that we have good treatments. But the problem is, for people with long-standing severe eating disorders, current treatments aren't very effective. And so now researchers and clinicians are asking, what else can we do? As a result, attention is turning to other types of treatment. There is evidence that there is a brain basis for eating disorders. But is there a way that we can treat the brain directly? Actually, there is. And part of my PhD is studying these potential treatments and seeing both whether they have any benefit in eating disorders and how they work. 
Okay. Childhood emotional and behavioural difficulties are very common. About three children in every classroom will have difficulties that are impairing their development. So in STARS we're using an intervention that aims to enhance teachers' classroom management skills to see whether it improves child mental health, teachers' um, levels of stress and professional self-efficacy and children's academic attainment. We have taken an existing excellent intervention called the Incredible Years Teacher Classroom Management course which um, uses six one-day sessions spaced a month apart during which teachers come along um, in groups of ten and have a safe space in which to think about how they might do things differently. I think the main thing about STARS is getting you into the frame of mind where you don't always have to pick up on the negatives and that you're constantly celebrating the good things that are happening and I think it takes a while to get into that mindset but the more time I spent going to the course and having the training the more I realised how it changes the way that you think and when you come back into the classroom that you consciously need to think about picking up on positive things but the more you do it the easier it is to spot all the wonderful things that children do and praise them for that rather than focusing on the negative and just almost ignoring the negative things. The Evidence for Change programme has been designed by a collaboration of evidence synthesis experts that have come together from across the North West Coast and our main goal and aim is to help support our partners in being able to find identify, analyse evidence to be able to inform policy, to inform practice and to inform research. What we're doing as part of the project is looking at how we can improve mental well-being of residents by focusing on engagement in meaningful activity. The ethos of occupational therapy is that meaningful and purposeful activity is vital in terms of our health and well-being. So, so my role really is to ensure that my patients are facilitated to engage in meaningful activity in order to improve the health and well-being. Everybody's got involved and they've all come and talked about the past and the things they like doing and what they'd like to continue doing and the sort of things they'd like to do and it's, it's been really interesting for me just to see how much people would like to be more engaged. I'm Mel Ferguson. Um, I work for the Nottingham Hearing Biomedical Research Unit that's funded by the National Institute for Health Research. And I lead a research team um, who looks at research on people with mild to moderate hearing loss. I'm also a consultant clinical scientist in audiology, so I've got a background in clinical audiology and I've had um, a number of years experience working in that field. The RLO-based um, project that we did was um, aimed at trying to improve knowledge and education for first-time hearing aid users. There's quite a bit of evidence to show that when people um, have clinical appointments that they forget a lot of the information that's given to them by their healthcare um, pr practitioner, whether it's a doctor or an audiologist. And there's other evidence to show that about half of the information that's given to first-time hearing aid users by their audiologists in their, in their hearing aid fitting appointment is forgotten um, a few weeks later. And one of the problems um, around this is that if people don't know how to use their hearing aids because they're quite complex to use, um, that this can lead to non-use of hearing aids or people may not use their hearing aids as, um, as much as they, they probably should. So we developed the RLOs and made an educational programme and then we trialled it in a large randomised control trial. We had 203 hearing aid users take part in the study and we showed a number of benefits um, from the RLOs with our clinical trial. And basically what we showed that people who use the RLOs had better knowledge about hearing, hearing loss, communication and hearing aids. Um, they had better practical handling skills for their hearing aids. Um, and also interestingly, um, in some people there was better hearing aid use. Together, the Royal Marsden and the Institute of Cancer Research comprise the only National Institute of Health Research Biomedical Research Centre dedicated solely to cancer. Our research strategy is heavily underpinned by investment in leading edge technologies and drug development that keep us at the forefront of cancer research and ultimately patient care. In 2014, we opened the West Wing Clinical Research Centre on the Sutton site of our hospital. 
This increased our capacity for delivering efficient, innovative clinical trials in a research-focused setting. West Wing Clinical Research Centre is staffed by a dedicated team incorporating patient schedulers, research nurses, clinical research fellows, a laboratory technician and a resident pharmacist. Each patient on a trial is allocated a key worker to ensure continuity of care whilst being treated on West Wing. So the Biomedical Research Centre here at UCLH, at UCL, leads on scientific translation for the partnership with a particular focus on experimental medicine studies and those studies that take place really very early on in the translational pathway. Quite commonly these are first in human studies uh, bringing new products, new therapies, uh, new uh, untested, relatively untested ideas out of the uh, laboratories uh, and into the clinical environment where they can be tested and investigated in human populations. So the importance of the biomedical research centres is that we actually do our research in a very specific space and that is in experimental medicine, really trying to harness the outstanding discovery science at UCL and translate that work into early phase studies in patients so that the NIHR funding for the BRC translates into real patient benefit. This is an unusual collaboration between researchers clinical researchers, particularly researching things that are clear um, or near the end of their development cycle, and providers and commissioners of care who are looking for evidence base to guide how they configure clinical services. So it's an attempt to get evidence-based um, research into clinical practice to produce science that's very relevant to care um, packages uh, out there in the community and at the interface with hospitals and assisting people providing that care to do that in the most cost-effective way. I love technology. The specialty I work in, eye surgery, is full of gadgets and technology. We have a real opportunity with the work we're doing to actually use an electronic device for the benefit of patients. It's my role as a surgeon to act as the interface between the engineers who make the electronics and the patients who have the disease. Through our work, which is funded by the Department of Health, through the Biomedical Research Centre, we are effectively funded by the taxpayer. And it's very important that we're accountable and we feedback the work that we're doing with those funds which we've been given. Also, in the hospital, we're treating patients. And again, we need to let those patients know what we're doing to treat the diseases which we can't treat today, but hopefully we can treat tomorrow. That makes it much better for them in terms of dealing with the disease. I think medical innovation is uh, something uh, fascinating, mainly because we are uh, sort of trying to improve um, people's health and at the same time reduce costs to the NHS. For example, in my specific case, we're working on uh, a technology to detect uh, early stage cancer. So uh, at the moment, there is a limit on the size and the type of cancer that can be detected. And with the work that we are doing, we aim to improve the detection of, uh, of certain types of cancer. It's a real pleasure to see young people uh, like yourselves here to come and tell us about your experiences. So what you do, you breathe in and out normally, and do those. So up through here, across through here, and down into our control room, so we can measure how much oxygen and carbon dioxide you're breathing in and out. Obviously there's normal air coming from the ceiling My name is Professor Rebecca Fitzgerald and I'm a group leader at the MRC Cancer Unit at University of Cambridge and an honorary consultant in gastroenterology. And I'm particularly interested in cancer of the esophagus, which is a disease which has become much more common 
in the last 30 years. So the main problem with this disease is late diagnosis. Patients just don't go and see their GP until they've really got troublesome symptoms. And unfortunately, a lot of patients are incurable at presentation. So the overall survival rate for this disease is about 13% at five years. So really abysmally awful. So in an ideal world, what we need is a very simple, inexpensive, relatively non-invasive test that GPs could do without having to refer to hospital for endoscopy to find these at-risk patients. And that's what we've been thinking about in our research. So the cytosponge is a very simple device, cell collection device. It's a capsule about the size of a multivitamin pill attached to a string. And the patient can swallow the, the capsule just as you'd swallow any pill. And it'll travel slowly down the esophagus and into the top of the stomach. Then you just wait three or four minutes and the capsule will dissolve. And as it dissolves, the tightly compressed sponge within the capsule will pop open. So then after five minutes has passed to be sure that that sponge has opened up, a nurse just simply pulls the sponge out of the esophagus and as it moves along the passage of the esophagus, it will collect cells on this sort of honeycomb lattice and you end up with about half a million cells to analyse in the laboratory. Theme 1 tries to answer the question, how can we best innovate in healthcare? And we're looking at three different products in Theme 1. One is around early intervention in psychosis. Often in healthcare you'll have adult services and child services and problems at those interfaces when people grow up, they're too grown up to be a child, but adult services don't really see them as an adult. And that's a problem that they found in mental health. And Professor Lennox leads a theme project around um, early intervention in psychosis that's age independent. It's a way of overcoming that. Jane Fossey leads a project looking at care homes and how to improve the care that we deliver for both mental and physical health in patients in care, particularly those with, with cognitive impairment. My project on the emergency multidisciplinary unit is answering a question about delivering care to a patient group that is typically older, living with frailty um, and face a number of challenges if they're put into an acute hospital bed during delivery of acute care. And we're looking at patients who are perhaps well enough to have an out of hospital care paradigm delivered, um, but they're still complex and living with significant frailty and dependency. And we're trying to work out, are there similar methods across all these three quite different questions that help us distill out what is it that's innovative, how do we evaluate it and assess it, and accelerate the innovation in care that we have in the NHS. As engineers working at Great Ormond Street Hospital, we are trying to find ways to translate some of the techniques and models that we are studying and developing in order to make them more relevant for the parents of the children that come to the cardiac unit for treating congenital heart disease and also for the clinicians that see them and that work with us. One technique especially that we have been working with is 3D printing or what's called rapid prototyping which consists in printing an object in 3D by manufacturing it layer by layer. What we're using this for is to make a 3D model of children's heart and the idea is not to make a generic one but to make it for every patient. Every week at least 12 young people die of undiagnosed heart conditions. Shiva Medical Systems, Manchester United, University of Exeter, Bristol Heart Institute and Crick have joined forces to help reduce the number through a research project and improve the lives of children with heart disease. This research project is the first of its kind, as it will monitor children's hearts while exercising and not at rest. And this will be using a Toshiba ultrasound scanner. Toshiba's heritage in applied research and development means that we have developed the technological ability to be an important partner in research of this kind. The research project is completely different uh, from any other screening process that has been done uh, in uh, the football arena. Our players are aged from uh, 14 to 16 years old, so I think if we can provide reassurance uh, to parents as well as the players, uh, I think that, will, that, that is clearly a good thing for the, for the health of our players, but also uh, for the health of the nation. Identifying the benefits and limits of exercise on young people's hearts will benefit all of us. 
Theme two of the Oxford Clark is health behaviours and behavioural interventions. The work in this theme focuses on helping patients to adopt healthful behaviours so that they can improve their, their health. Um, in particular, our group is focusing on physical activity, so finding ways to make people more physically active alongside other chronic health conditions, such as persistent long, low back pain or conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis or dementia. We are also interested in looking at how we make people more physically active alongside other behavioural interventions, such as helping patients to stop smoking or even NHS health checks. As a physiotherapist, I'm really interested in providing the best treatment we can for our patients, and especially evidence-based practice. So what's really exciting about the project that we're doing now is that it's actually allowing us to take the research work we've done one step further and to look how we get that evidence into practice and how we make sure that the treatment that we tested is actually being provided for patients in the NHS. My research is part of the multimorbidity theme of the Oxford Clark and it focuses on the problem of depression in people with cancer. So multimorbidity just means that someone has more than one medical illness and our theme in the Oxford Clark is particularly focusing on people who have what we call medical psychiatric multimorbidity. So that means people who have what we traditionally call a medical problem and also what we might traditionally call a psychiatric or a psychological problem. We know that depression is a really common problem for people with cancer. About 10% of people who have a diagnosis of cancer will also have what we might call major depression or clinical depression. But the majority of those people don't get treatment for the depression. So our team has developed a new treatment program called Depression Care for People with Cancer and that includes treatment from a team of cancer nurses and psychiatrists. And they work together to make sure that the patient's depression care is part of their cancer care, so it's fully integrated. My name's Alex Cairns. Um, I'm an academic clinical fellow looking at the management of women who've developed raised blood pressure in pregnancy after they've delivered their baby and once they've gone home from hospital. I'm a trainee obstetrician, so I work as a doctor up at the John Radcliffe Hospital, um, delivering babies and looking after women both antenatally, so whilst they're pregnant and postnatally. Theme five um, of the Clark is a um, broader span of research looking at developing technologies and different interventions to allow um, patients with all sorts of different things wrong with them um, to manage their own conditions. Um, so looking at how we can use things like home blood pressure monitors, um, mobile technology, both apps and text messages to allow them to have more control. 